I'm Dr. David Korsmeyer. I am the uh, Deputy Center Director for the NASA Ames Research Center, uh, sited in Silicon Valley, uh, California. I'm one of the 10 NASA centers. NASA is the National Aeronautics and Space Agency. We uh, were founded in 1958. As an act of Congress, uh, we actually got a law was signed. It was called the Space Act, very appropriately, in response to Sputnik, uh, when the U.S. decided to focus its research agencies on space. And uh, we were already existing. We'd been founded in 1939 on the West Coast to do aeronautics research. So it was a natural follow-on uh, to do space research. And that's what we do. We're one of the four core research centers at NASA, uh, covering all the domains of space, human exploration, science, and technology. The Artemis mission is the current activity that NASA's human exploration is focused on. This is uh, named after the twin sister of Apollo. Artemis is this millennia's Apollo, uh, in the sense that we are going back to the moon, this time to stay. We're actually returning and trying to make this a sustainable long-term uh, activity, just like we've made living and working in low Earth orbit uh, sustainable for the past 20 years. Um, NASA's focus uh, with Artemis is first building the infrastructure to allow us to launch regularly humans and robotic activities back to the moon to explore this time the whole surface of the moon, whereas we look just at the equator of the moon in a few regions, we're going to be looking the entirety of the globe, a North Pole and South Pole, and looking for opportunities to set up a scientific base there. Uh, the first mission, Artemis II, was done last fall uh, in the November-December time frame, and uh, the next mission that's coming up is uh, Artemis II, where we're going to be flying humans in deep space. Uh, we just drove the spacecraft actually on Artemis I, and uh, then Artemis III will be in uh, several years, probably 2026, 2027, where we're going to land uh, on the south pole of the moon, which is a whole new area, very hard to get to, very hilly, and has got regions of permanent uh, light and permanent dark, because uh, like any uh, polar region. The sun is on the horizon all the time. From a research and R&D perspective, some of the core technologies and from a science perspective, some of the core science that NASA needs to know to go back sustainably to the lunar surface is um, really how varied the moon is. We've only again been to the equator region. Uh, on the near side of the moon, the side that we always see up uh, in space. But the moon, like any planetary body, is very varied. It's got uh, all sorts of uh, different areas, and we don't understand fully how the moon was formed. Uh, we don't understand fully how the moon kind of sustains itself. It's not tectonically active like the Earth is, so uh, the plate tectonics, the movement of the continents, has uh, allowed land masses to form and actually allows uh, deposits of resources to exist. We don't know where the resources, where the natural environments are on the moon and how varied they are. So we're going to the south pole of the moon. One of the things we're doing is we're developing a, a rover called Viper, a volatile inspecting polar exploration rover. Um, and that is going to drive around the south pole of the moon and go into what we call permanently shadowed regions, permanently shadowed craters. Uh, these are areas that have not received sunlight in over a billion years. That's a thousand million for the uh, English speaking. Um, that's a long time. And in that time, all sorts of things could collect in there and we don't really understand it. One, because we can't see inside of it, but two, because um, in the sun, it's almost 200 degrees Kelvin, which is 200 degrees centigrade. And in the shade, with the permanently shadowed region, it's 200 degrees negative uh, centigrade or 200 degrees negative Kelvin. Very, very hot, very, very cold. A lot of technology development to make that work. And then once we're in there, we need to discover what it is, why it is, where it is, and how it got there. And there's a lot of science to be done to figure that out. There's two types of innovation that we tend to think of, or at least uh, conceive of at NASA Ames. Uh, one is evolutionary innovation, where we know there's an area of interest that we want to do better in. We want to try new approaches, we want to try new technologies, um, 
we want to maybe say, we want to achieve this, but we don't know how to achieve this, so community, come help us figure out the best way to achieve this goal. Um, that's necessary, that's required, and we have those type of activities going on all the time. And industry and academia make use of that as a great teaching tool and a way to generate new ideas as well. There's another area that we call revolutionary innovation, where we don't know what we don't know. Um, we're just looking for almost literally the crazy idea. Uh, we want to instigate that with the idea that most of them aren't going to really work that maybe nine out of the 10 ideas, the first time we ask the question, really won't be relevant. They'll come up with something that's so crazy it doesn't make sense, but the one out of the 10 will have something there. There'll be some gem of an idea that will actually have value to our overall NASA mission. And then letting that kind of grow, letting that blossom a little bit and see is there some, what we call legs on it, to make it actually applicable to NASA has proven time and time again uh, at our research center to be highly valuable and highly contributory to coming up with true radical innovation that changes the whole way we look at the universe, sometimes the whole way we look at the technical field. At the Artemis uh, activity, when we're getting back to the moon, we're going to be landing in all sorts of new regions. One of it is the South Pole. Um, we have never humanity uh, visited the South Pole until very recently, and that was the Chandrayaan-3 lander uh, from India, did a great job. Uh, applause to them and kudos for the technical skills. Um, but that is the first time we've ever actually put uh, a rover or a set of instruments in that area, and it uh, has a limited scope so far. NASA really needs to understand the entirety of that region if we're going to send people back to explore, to discover, and eventually to live, work, and operate. Um, a good analogy is, say, uh, the Antarctic Station. Uh, you know, that's a whole continent. You can't just touch one shore and say, I've got it, I understand Antarctica completely, I'm all good. Or another good analogy is the, the surface area of the moon is about equivalent to the continent of Africa. You can't just show up on, pick a shore of Africa or on the top of Mount Kilimanjaro and say, that's it, I understand Africa completely. That would be obviously uh, silly and maybe stupid. So if we're going to go to a region, we need to understand it. We need to understand how it was formed, why things are there, where there's stuff of interest and where there's stuff of potential safety or concern. Um, and that's part of the exploration we're trying to do because our understanding of how the moon was formed, understanding of how the solar system uh, collected various bodies together, really is a better understanding of how the Earth was formed and how the Earth exists. You know, it's like saying, I've got one house in the neighborhood and all I care about is that house. No, you care about the neighborhood. You want to understand why the neighborhood's there, what ends of the street do, and all the infrastructure in between. That's what we need to do. We need to understand our solar system to truly understand our planet, to truly understand our place in the universe. So 20 years in the future, where are we going to be? What is humanity's participation in space going to be like? Well, look 20 years in the past. Uh, in the early 2000s, um, it was just forming a new International Space Station. We just permanently crewed it for the first time, so we had people living and working there 24 by 7 by 365 days a year. But the industry in low Earth orbit was still driven almost solely by the government. I mean, sure, there were telecommunication satellites, and that's very important. Everyone needed their uh, satellite TV. Um, but it wasn't as viable or strong on its own uh, as it is now, right? In uh, 2023, 2024, uh, there is a whole set of industries, a whole set of companies, a whole set of technical activities, investment going on that is completely independent from NASA, completely independent from the federal government. Okay, roll things forward 20 more years. What could that be like? Well, instead of just being in low Earth orbit and just having an international space station owned and operated by federal governments, right now it's uh, Russia and America, and then China has a, has a space station. Imagine commercial 
international space stations. Commercial places where people can live, work, and operate, where pharmace uh, pharmaceuticals, material scientists are doing research and work, and then imagine going a little bit further out towards the moon, uh, what we call cislunar space, in between the Earth and the moon. That region becoming much more active commercially with a lot more activities occurring and potentially occurring also on the moon. If there's uh, resources or capabilities there that we want to make use of, hey, the government doesn't want to go out there and build a, a plant to extract oxygen uh, sustainably from the surface of the moon, but we sure would love to be able to hire somebody to do that. So maybe that's the future that uh, is going to exist in 20 years from now. Mars is on the roadmap for NASA as the next really big goal. And people always say, well, why Mars? Okay, that's a great question, actually. Why Mars? Why not, why not Venus? Why not Jupiter? Well, okay, Mars is our closest analogous planet where humanity could live, work, and operate sustainably. Um, it's got an atmosphere, now a very thin one, but still enough to protect us from the sun and the cosmic rays. It's got gravity, uh, about a quarter or almost a third of what it here exists on Earth. So that means uh, we can live and work and operate without you know, taking uh, anti-low uh, uh, G drugs. Um, and it actually has almost a 24 hour day. So strangely enough, you can kind of live there and just be in a different time zone all the time. But that capability of uh, exploring and understanding a new world that is very similar to our own, that is the benefit we're going to gain. It's, um, it's like having twins or having siblings. If you look at one person and they're just there all the time, you understand them. If you look at them and their siblings, you now understand their family, right? That's the goal of what we're trying to do. These are called terrestrial bodies because they're like terra, terra firma, Earth. Mars is another terrestrial body by understanding it, by understanding the moon, by understanding even some of the other planets, we're going to better understand them. So I'd say there's a significant role for quantum computing, quantum sensing, quantum uh, technologies in the future. Future. It's a it's a domain where there's a lot of interest here on Earth to basically understand how that slightly different view of physics helps us uh, do new things, right? It's always not at micro scale. Sometimes it's at macro scale. It's understanding how physics works in a novel way that's going to enable us to understand better how to leverage different technologies, how to find out new science, and how to better discover new activities. Um, understanding the universe is part and parcel of what NASA does. Quantum, quantum technologies, quantum physics, all of that leads into helping us as an additional toolkit and to understand our overall universe. So there's a concept in uh, computing, and especially quantum computing, called quantum supremacy. It's the idea that there are problems that are so hard, you really can't do them on supercomputers today at all. They will take almost infinite time to solve the problem. The idea of quantum supremacy is there those problems, a class of those problems, can actually be solved by a quantum computer. Now, if a quantum computer can solve them, and a normal computer, even a normal supercomputer, can't solve them, the quantum computer is supreme. It has supremacy over normal computing. Now, in 2019, at actually NASA Ames, and in partnership with Google, um, we were able to validate that there are problems like that, and a quantum computer can solve it, a problem that a normal supercomputer can't be done. What have we done in the past, you know, five years from then? Well, quite a lot. We've actually discovered new classes of problems that also are in that area and are developing the algorithms to solve them quicker, faster, and operationally, right? One way to do it is a tech demo. Now we're doing it as a practice, and that's a great step forward. Anybody can get into space activities. That's the beauty of space activities. It sounds like it's hard, but it's not. We need normal people doing normal things uh, to make uh, space beneficial to all of us here on Earth, around the globe.
Um, anyone can get involved. Uh, anyone from you know uh, a food scientist to a quantum uh, physicist. They're all available areas of interest. Um, NASA, uh, the Australian Space Agency, other agencies around the globe are all look, looking for excited people, people with a passion for space. That's going to make much more of an impact, frankly, than their one particular domain knowledge. It's you know, also have a passion for space with your skill set, because your skill set almost assuredly will be valuable to us. There's a large contingent of senior people uh, visiting Australia this week here in Perth uh, for the Indo-Pacific uh, Space and Earth Science Conference. Um, it's because we're here at the invitation of the Australian Space Agency and local industry and academia, um, and where we've already established relationships across the world for other activities. You know, I've met much of the, uh, these people at other conferences and they've been back in the U United States visiting my NASA center, Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley. Plus, NASA is looking for international partners as we continue to use, understand, and explore space. Uh, the Australian Space Agency is uh, one of the key partners we're looking to have and we're looking at how Australian academia and industry can play a significant role in the future exploration of the Moon and Mars and the overall Artemis program. An Australian Space Agency uh, program, uh, I believe called Trailblazer. Two competing groups uh, working to come up with an idea for a lunar rover, uh, Australian design, built, operating. Um, that is gonna be launched ideally on a commercial lunar payload system, which is a program we call Eclipse. Uh, that NASA runs, where we've uh, established a series of contracts with uh, various corporations that will help land things on the surface of the moon at a greatly reduced cost. So they're developing the technologies, they're developing the uh, capabilities. NASA is helping them out, but they're taking much of the investment risk, as we like to say. Um, CLIPS is landing a number of NASA program activities, and we're making the, uh, the CLIPS program available to international partners. And I believe Trailblazer is going to make use of the CLIPS program to land on uh, various regions of the moon, the Australian rover. And the Australian rover, I think, has the goal to go out and show how it can collect uh, regolith, which is the fancy name for moon dirt, um, collect the regolith, pull it together, and put it in a uh, kind of a pile. The goal here is to figure out how to make use of the natural resources on the moon for the benefit of our explorers uh, in a sustainable, uh, uh, appropriate fashion, right? How do we, can we pull oxygen out of uh, any of the water ices we find? Can we make use of the regolith itself simply as a shielding from radiation? So all of those things are quite important. We don't really know how to do kind of mining excavation activities on the moon. I think Trailblazer is a first step along that way.